people will disappoint you and will stab you in the back, I don't know how you say it, to betray you, mm. that is close to you, and it hurts. It's not easy to get over, and the tendency is to keep people at bay. But I find if I, if I keep people at bay, I can't, I can't get deep. I can't get with them. I can't go with them. You know what I'm saying? So I've got to get over that to be able to get back to a point where, hey, if they, if, if it happens again, it happens again. But I can't, but look how many that have gotten close who are now flowering because you allow them to get, get close to you in, in uh, close discipleship. And um, I think that's just part of the ministry. If I had Spurgeon here, I'd, I'd turn to uh, lectures to my students and read you some interesting phraseology of uh, Brother Spurgeon um, uh, that I've used on numerous occasions to comfort my soul. He was a pastor speaking to pastors. But um, I'll pray for that, Chris. I pray that this will become a, b a bad situation that God works for good. That you will have this wonderful opportunity for these young'uns to, to grow up spiritually through this. And uh, that, you, that you don't lose anybody. That's what I pray. I don't want to lose anybody. Over this, <clears throat> yeah. Thanks. I mean, uh, I usually get this brought up during my pastoral ministry courses, <laughs> but uh, great. So we need to pray for Chris for sure on that. Um, <clears throat> um, shall I turn to? I guess Paul's ministry in Acts 20 is probably the best. Um, so maybe we'll just go there unless the Lord brings something else up. Um, I've had all kinds of things. I had, I've had devotions for both of my classes which I didn't use. <laughs> God did something else. <laughs> I love it because I ask him to do it all the time. I said, this is not it, Lord. You just bring it up. So, um, um, let's just uh, start with Acts 20, verse 17, where it says that Paul comes to Miletus. is a little island town uh, west of Turkey now. He's a miner then. And he went to Ephesus. He sent to Ephesus, excuse me. And called to him the elders of the church. So <clears throat> what we see there is that an elder were the leaders of the church. And they did the shepherding, shepherding and pastoring and overseeing. I just showed you that in verse 28. And he says, you yourself know from the first day that I set foot in Asia how I was with you the whole time. Now notice what he did. Serving the Lord with all humility and with tears. Ever had tears in the ministry? Well, you're not much of a minister if you don't have them. Guarantee tears and with trials. Notice that. Humility, tears, and trials which came upon me through the plots of the Jews. How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable. Teaching you publicly and from house to house. He made house calls. <laughs> 
That's what the old way used to be, right? So, um, he didn't shrink back declaring to anything that was profitable. In verse 21, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. I like that. Because you're turning from something to something. When is it that you're turning from something to something? Well, you're doing it all the same time. You're turning from something to something. So, faith and repentance. Now, behold, bound in, um, I would say, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. <laughs> okay? So, he wants, to, he wants to do all these things. He wants to, to follow God. Uh, and the Spirit of God is binding him to this even when he doesn't know where he's going or what he's supposed to do. Okay? But that's his heart. He, he want, I don't know what I'm supposed to do, but I want to do it for the Lord, whatever it is. And then verse 22 now bound, oh yeah, I already got that. Uh, knowing, what, knowing what will, oh. But in verse 22, uh, it says, I'm on my way to Jerusalem not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying, bonds and afflictions await for me. So I'm bound to do, by, I'm bound to the Holy Spirit whether I know what I'm supposed to be doing. And when I know what's going to happen to me and I don't like it. When I know and when I don't know. Alright. And then he makes his sacrifice. But I do not consider my life of any count as dear to myself. In order that I might finish my course. Whoa. I'm willing to sacrifice anything to finish my course and uh, that God and my ministry for which God has given me. Can you say that? I, I that's I, I don't consider my life. I'm in other words, I'm willing to give up my life for the mission the course, and the ministry for which God has given me. You remember Paul at the end of his life? 2 Timothy? Fight the good fight? And what? Well, let's turn to it. Hold your place here. All right. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 7. Or excuse me, it's chapter 4. <laughs> chapter 4, verse 7. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. It's the same thing you talk back here. I don't, count, I don't count my life as dear to myself. In other words, I'm willing to lose it for the course for which God says I'm to walk. Okay? And I want to fight the good fight. I want to finish the course. I want to keep the faith. In Hebrews chapter 12, these are all connected together uh, using this word. Verse 1, Therefore, since we have... So great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before me. I call that the course. <laughs> okay? He didn't use the word, but the word concept is there, isn't it? 
And notice it's the race that he set. Don't look at your neighbor. It's what, it's what God set before you. Yours may be different. You say, why come I had to run down this road? Well, it's because he told you to. <laughs> That's your course. Okay? That he said. You're fixing your eyes on Jesus, right? And so back in Acts 20, the ministry and the course uh, um, which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the grace, gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that all uh, I know that all of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom will see my face no more. Therefore, I testify to you this day: I am innocent of uh, of the blood of <clears throat> all men, for I did not shrink from declaring to you. The whole counsel, purpose of God. I didn't ride a hobby horse. I tried to give you the full counsel of God. And then he says to be on guard for yourself and for the flock. Be on guard. Notice who puts people in positions are supposed to be among which the Holy Spirit has made you oversee. The shepherd of the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. So, there's many beautiful things that we are to do. Uh, we are to guard, we are to keep, we are to admonish, we are to be examples uh, of the flock. Acts 20 is a biggie in, in this. I used to tell my congregation, uh, this is, well, savage wolves will come in, dressed up with, you know, like sheep, says in Acts 20. And I always look for an opportunity in my sermons to come to that text at least once a year so I could say, well, if you are a wolf and you, you're trying to masquerade as a sheep, I want you to know the elders of this church are looking for you. <laughs> I'd actually say that to my congregation. I, I wanted to warn the wolf, but I wanted to comfort the sheep that we got to we got a sheep dog among us. You call the elders a sheep dog? Oh yeah, <laughs> oh yeah, sheep dogs. If you know sheep dogs, they are very protective. As a matter of fact, they they will bark in the night, not not knowing whether there's anything out there. If you if you ever see a sheep dog, they do that. They will. If it's too silent, they'll bark. Go. Burr, 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 burr. Why? Just, Just I'm out here. I'm here. Mm -hmm. I'm here. That's exactly right. They're putting they're putting whoever's out there on notice that we're here. And that's what we have to do for our flocks. Okay. Yeah, but do you think we're not vigilant enough in our churches to do that? I uh, know. Part of it the congregation has to see the love of the shepherd. Well, why would you let him do it? Uh, Hebrews uh, 13. I'm just happy to be there. Uh, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. <laughs> so when somebody says to me, you know, I get on, I, I regularly. <laughs> Uh, ask people one on one only. How's your soul? I I had a little saying. If I ask you uh, in my church, how you doing? You know, that's a Texas. Tell me whatever you want. You lie to me or just say, yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> you I'm fine. I'm dying inside. But you know, hi. But if I come up to you and I just I just let them know how this is, and I ask you, how's your soul? Which I'd only do 
uh, one-on-one because it's not fair to do that in a group. Right. With, uh, you know, that's just not fair. <clears throat> I'd say, how's your soul? I said, don't mess with me. I'm your shepherd. You tell me how you're soul. And if you tell me every time, if I told you, ask you every week and you told me you're fine every week, you're probably lying. I mean, I don't do, I tell them, I, I tell them, I don't do good every week. I want to. So it's not, it's not, I'm not going to go, oh, you're not doing what? I mean, <laughs> every, I mean, everybody doesn't do well at, at times, but that's when you should say, pray for me. What is it? How can we come alongside and help within the body? And we don't do that enough as individuals. You don't have to be a shepherd. You don't have to be an elder. You don't have to be a pastor. People say, "Don't you? Don't you get tired? You know, don't you get itching because you know yeah, you you are a pastor?" Yeah, you know, I say, "Yeah, I have a gift of pastor." But I'm going to tell you something. You don't have to have a position to exercise your gift. I don't have a position in a church. But I exercise my gift every time I go. Yeah. And so, um, we don't do it enough, I think. Um, and the flock suffers because of it. And But if... A shepherd will constantly pursue. He, he's constantly asking. He's constantly in. He hears about something. He will call. I'll have a, a person not show up at church two or three weeks or two weeks, probably at the most, and I'll call him. I say, I'm calling not to check up on you, as, as though I'm trying to check low. I just want to make sure you're okay. And they go, I'm okay. I said, oh, okay. I just want to make sure. Because I haven't seen you a couple weeks, that's all. And then if they don't say anything, I don't say anything. You know? Most of the time they'd say something. You know, no, no, while no. we were on vacation or we were this, I said, hey man, just let me know so I will call you. <laughs> that because. It, it, to some people, that's a threat, and that's okay for, because I think they need to get over it. Mm-hmm. They they need to get they need to get to know that I'm not trying to be anything but a loving shepherd to them. And when they when they finally stayed long enough, they understood that. They they didn't take offense of me calling or coming by. And. Um, and uh, so, therefore, uh, yeah, I think we miss it, bro. And what we what we need to do is what I I found that I'm only one person, and I can man, I could. Uh, the Lord gave me stamina that I could work long hours, but it, you you can get worn down. So I need. I need to pray and to disciple people to do the same thing. To check up on a group of people that 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 is younger in the faith or whatever. So so that people begin to understand as they mature on. That's where you find your leadership too. Uh, also, you find leadership in the midst of of uh, of the most strangest thing, and that is. Uh, trouble in the church. Did you know that? Let me. I, I was uh, expositing the scriptures, okay, in First Corinthians, which is a dangerous book uh, because it has so many issues that people don't. Actually, our church just finished up First Corinthians, going through the book, <clears throat> saying it's like nine months. Is, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, praise God. I mean, and yeah, there was a lot of tough topics. Let's see if I got it here. Hang on here. Uh, 
You know, you know it's on the left side of the page. <laughs> uh, let's see. Oh, I bet it's, uh, it's got to be that. <coughs> Find it here. I put the war. I put a. I remember a note out there on the side. Ah, of course, chapter eleven, First Corinthians eleven. Let's start with seventeen. But in giving this instruction, I do not praise you because you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear <laughs> that divisions, uh, schemata, was we get schisms from in English. It's a Greek word. Exist among you and in part I believe it. For there must be heresis is the Greek word, which we get our word heresy. That, that, uh, that, for there must be factions among you. Must in order, purpose clause, that those who are approved may have become evident among you. So, where there's faction and trouble, which you don't want, they're, they're, the mature believers will arise and give wise counsel according to the scriptures and act godly. And you go, there's some leaders there. There's some godly leaders. Because they demonstrated it at the proper time. Isn't that weird? So, I always wondered, I said, Lord, why do you cause all this, you know, why do, we, why do you, you know, you could keep this from happening in the church. He says, yeah, I know. But you don't know who your leaders are unless I do it. Allow it to happen. <laughs> so, that was a great comfort for me as a leader. <laughs> I said, well, at least I know one reason why we have divisions in the church. <laughs> Well, thanks for the question, Chris. I, I, I pray that there is some help there, bro, on that. So we need to pray for Chris and his youth group and scriptures into your ministry, right? <laughs> on this. So let's uh, turn to 1 John. And I would like to set the setting for this book. I have found, unless you do this, then you will have um, questions uh, that you will not know how to answer because you didn't know the setting for which the book was written or the letter that was written. First of all, John is familiar with his audience. Um, so he's not writing a letter that he's never been to or, to, uh, or don't know the people. And second of all, John writes with authority. Notice the first four verses of the first chapter. What was from the beginning what we have heard, what we have seen, our eyes, what we have beheld, and our hands has handled concerning the word of life. We've touched him. Yes, sir. He was real. This is not just a concept. Our fathom. And the life was 
manifested and we have seen and bear witness and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, that you also may have fellowship with us. Indeed, our fellowship was with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write so that our joy may be made complete. Okay? So, here we have John writing with great authority. Uh, and guess who he connects to? The Father and the Son. <laughs> On that. Notice there is a presence in this letter of false teachers. Chapter 2, verse 18. Children, it is the last hour. And just as you've heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have arisen. From this we know that it is the last hour. Now, so John understands a personal Antichrist that he, he calls the beast in Revelation, which we will study uh, next week, Lord willing, start in. But there are many antichrists or the spirit of antichrist or those who follow the way of the antichrist in the world today. So, though the antichrist incarnate is not with us at this time, as far as I know, but there are many antichrist spirits or uh, movements or people who are involved of what the antichrist will be doing. So that's why, he, that's the kind of things he's saying. Verse 27 of the same chapter 2. And as for you, the anointing uh, <clears throat> which you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need of anyone to teach you, but as... Uh, chapter 2, 18, yeah. Oh, but as his anointing teaches you about all things and is true, and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you abide in him. So, he, the anointing, of course, is the Holy Spirit that comes on every person the moment that they believe. Um, <clears throat> verse, chapter 4, verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So there's a presence of false teaching in the church. Not only that, there is a church split. That's how we say it. Schism in the church. Chapter 2, verse 19. 19. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would not would have remained with us. But they went out for the purpose in order that it might be shown that they are not of us. Now, I've had many people quote this passage when people leave the church and, and therefore really quoting it in an incorrect way. Just because people leave you doesn't necessarily mean that this is what has happened. He's talking about they left us because they ain't believers. Okay? Well, some people may leave the church who are believers, okay? So be careful how you use this text. It says here... They, they went out from us because they were not of us. Okay? Yeah. When we were studying uh, Hebrews chapter 6, is this one of the, could this verse be compared to that for us, the unbelievers? They was enlightened. And... Yeah. It, it, it is different in the sense that I'm not sure that these Jewish 
uh, these excuse me, these people were Jewish and that they uh, were schooled in Jewish thought. It could be Gentiles. I don't know. So it's not exactly the same, but it's likened unto it in the sense that they're not believers. But they have somehow masqueraded themselves to be thinking that they were believers for a while. Because now they they are going out from us but because they're not of us. Okay? And fifth, the schism is a doctrinal controversy though ethical issues are involved. Now we just read chapter 2 verse 19, right? Notice verse 20. But you have an anointing from the Holy One and you all know I have not written to you because you do not know the truth but because you do know the truth and because the lie is not of the truth. Think there has a, there's a problem between what is truth and lie? Yeah. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? So what were they doing? They're saying Jesus is not the, the Messiah. This is the Antichrist. The one who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. That is one of the main issues. That this group that went out from them had the problem. Which we saw with our false teachers. Yes. So, so does this come into play with your Jude and yeah. Second yeah. Peter paper? Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, this your your ears are going. Bling, bling. Oh, yeah, yeah, man. I remember doing that in Second Peter. And, yeah. Uh, you will, you will never be the same going through this course <coughs> because of what you studied, and you will be hopefully very uh, astute about false teaching. But I hope you don't pounce on people. You see what I'm saying? Yes. Careful. You know. Absolutely. Yes. In the, well, to me, it's amazing that after we've done the work on false teachers and everything, after doing all of that, it's not more evident you start seeing stuff or people say stuff or you're being exposed to stuff. I had a college student come in and give me this long explanation, even though I didn't ask for it, on why she was about to get a tattoo that had, uh, inshallah, as the tattoo. And she says, I know it has, has to do with Allah, but that's not why I'm getting it. But I just want people to know that, you know, I believe in God. So why are you getting the tattoo? And she couldn't explain, but she had heard somebody say that you're supposed to write God's name on your body. And she could not tell me where she heard this, but she was like, I was at a church visiting with a friend. I'd say, I got an assignment for you. <laughs> Get a concordance out and do as much as study you want and show me where that verse is. <laughs> but it was just amazing how now you, you have these people who are teaching quote unquote Christian beliefs, but they're no root they're not rooted in the Bible. They're yeah. so far from the Bible that people are, are explaining them as, as new revelations and they've you know been enlightened to know these things, but there is no no biblical truth or proof of it. When you again, when you when you hoist your anchor from the scriptures, you become adrift in the sea of unbelievable ideas and with no discernment. The, the, the question you know, ultimately comes to young people and every person, adults also is, what is your authority? What... What is truth? Truth conforms to the mind of God. And how you know the mind of God except through the Word of God. I haven't checked on this, but um, while we're doing that paper, there's somebody I was watching, a preacher that was talking about that uh, Jesus talked more about apostasy than he did any, any other topic. And I haven't checked that to see. He talked about, or warnings. 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 Yeah, warnings about false teachers and yeah, I, I, I wouldn't doubt that one. That might uh, it's a it's one of the it's one of the main things. I guarantee you. Yeah. 
Because how else? I mean, you know, take take the Garden of Eden when when the evil one uh, uh, approaches Eve. Has God said? Question mark. And then he then he says he hadn't told you that. This bold lie. So. What is hideous about the secular universities of this day is that they are pumping the kids full of untruths about what is their authority, of how they should guide their life. And it's not the Bible, and it's not God as a general rule. Yeah, just a quick question. If... Say like reading Romans 9, when you're looking at election and predestination, if somebody's getting false doctrine, how does that affect that person? He, he, he is, he has pulled his anchor. He, 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 has, he has put blinders on. He will stumble in the dark. Do you think that would lead to an unbelieving heart? Uh, sometimes... And sometimes not. Now, this is where Chris can come into play a lot because what happens sometimes is a young person knows the truth because he grew up in it, his parents have taught it, they, they're at a great church and this, that, and the other, but, but it's my parents' truth and my church's truth, but not mine yet. In other words, I am bought unto it. And that's the kind of breaks your heart. Because they've heard, they know this, that, and the other, but they haven't. They haven't really. It's it's somebody else's, and 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 every parent needs to understand that's the way it is until they do make that decision. Yeah, there is no ownership. Yeah, just because you, just because you've taught them this, that, and the other, it hasn't stuck. I mean, I I've had so many people. Uh, come into my office and uh, uh, talk about um, sin or whatever it is and uh, I said well what is the truth about this what is right and what is wrong how do you know I mean if you hadn't settled those basic issues then you know, yeah. sky's a limit of what, what you're going to do in your practice, and especially today. And so, uh, you you are constantly wanting your your young people in your home to make decisions according to something that they now have bought into, not just because I said so now, because this is me, this is who I am, this is the truth. And part of that is telling them what is not truth. Tell them what they will hear out there. And why it isn't truth. And that means we have to do studying. Yeah, bro? The interesting thing is, as you walk through that, there are a lot of adults who never got that reconciled when they were younger. And they just transferred it to their, their, their current self. And they're still holding on to what they think they heard in some church. Or they, they're calling it faith, but it's really... Just subjective to this theory more than anything. There is no, it's not found roots. And those are the ones that you know, I see parents now have kids, and there's no conversation, like you were talking earlier, there's no authentic conversation at home about the state of the soul of the child. Because parents don't want to deal with the state of their own soul. Yeah, yeah. How can you, how can you take care of somebody, your children, if you're not, yeah. if you're not well? Yeah. Now, God in His mercy, I've seen. This is just phenomenal. I'm not sure, Chris, you see it. I, I, I had people, uh, young people in my youth group who had a terrible home. Yes. But they bought the truth. Yeah. And they became really strong believers. Yeah. That was just mercy. Yes, sir. Sheer mercy. Well, you know it always is, but it was so evident it was so. You see somebody grew up in a Christian home and learned from that and then buy into it, you kind of go, well, yeah, they got in a Christian home. Yeah, but look at look at Johnny over here. 
He comes here and he's he didn't his parents didn't come this that and the other and he gets home he has to you know his druggies and this that and the other and what's happening this happening and, and look what he's doing. The, the, the glory of all of that is when you see that kid who is in that environment and then they're able to witness to their parents. parents. Yeah. That is something that is. I bet that's how. That's powerful. Yeah. Wow. That's wow. powerful. Yeah. <clears throat> I saw a guy recently baptize his own son. Yeah. Oh, it broke me in tears. Oh, yeah, bro. <laughs> this is good. Bro, yeah. yeah. I, I had yeah. an opportunity to do that for my son, and that was yeah. really, really special. If, yeah, if was like 18. If the, if the, if the father is a, a strong believer, I, I recommend it. <clears throat> yeah. I mean. I love stuff break, break me down because that one got me. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. That gets a little, you know. I, I, of course, I had the privilege of Baptized both my sons, but I was a pastor, so what do you expect? <laughs> so, but I, I recommend it. I mean, some people think, well, no, only the pastor or the assistant pastor can do that. So where do you find that in the Bible? I struggled with that. I, I did about, when they told me I could do that, I did about two or three weeks to say, what well, gives me the authority to be able to do this? Yeah. Like, well, as a believer, I'm given the authority. Yeah, yeah you're the believer, bro. Believer, okay. The priesthood of the believer. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's a it's a special privilege on that. All right, so um, the doctrinal issue there. Uh, did we look at First John four one? Yeah, we we need to. <laughs> beloved, verse uh, First John four one and two. Um, beloved, do not believe every spirit. I did read that, didn't I? Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, I didn't read verse 2 probably. For this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. So they are evidently saying that Jesus is was not truly man. And so a docetic type of Jesus. He just seemed like he was human but not really. And uh, beginnings some of the they all call it incipious Gnosticism, but it's the beginning of Gnostic beliefs of the second century, which comes into full play, that is hideous and a great menace to the Christianity. Because it's close in some degrees, but not. And then, um, uh, Second John... <laughs> seven for many deceivers have gone out into the world those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ is come in the flesh <coughs> this is the deceiver and the antichrist which watch yourself that you might not lose what we have accomplished but that you may receive full reward, a reward. Anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. And the one who abides in the teaching, he has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you, you all, plural, and does not bring this teaching do not receive him into your house and do not give him a greeting for the one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. Ooh. I can remember some false teachers coming to my church, you know. I was kind to them, but I didn't give them a dime. Didn't give them anything. And I told them why. What if they come to your door to your house? You just stop them there? Yeah, I'll just say, you know, I'd witness still. Yeah, can't you give me some of that? No, nah, I ain't gonna give you anything. You just get, you know, you just get strength to go out and let, to spread your ungodliness. No, I'm not gonna do it. Yeah. Do you invite them in your house? No. You? Okay. Yeah. No. Yeah. I, it, it's it, it's nothing wrong with inviting them in to talk to sit down to uh, uh, to argue with them. I call it. But I'm not giving I'm not giving the right hand of Christian fellowship and uh, uh, or uh, you know have them dine with me in a sense of everything's fine. Right. No. 
They, they asked, well, can we use the copy machine to, to print off some of our material? I said, no. I said, that's, that's false. That's right. Can you use my fire He said, fire. you're not. I, 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 I'm sure they were kind of saying, well, you're not Christian. Well, I am Christian. That's what Paul, John says I'm to do to you. <laughs> I'm not supposed to welcome you. I'm not supposed to give you and everything and any advantage to go on and, and populate the ungodliness and false doctrines that you are now given. <laughs> so, so. Now, let's hone in a little more closely to the opponents of John as we can understand it. 1 John 4, 6. We are from God. He who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know that the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Now if you don't place that in the context of what John is facing, then you will use this in an incorrect way. You know, you can't contradict me because you contradict me, then you're contradicting God. And just that. Well, what's the context? He's speaking about these false teachers. He's saying... <clears throat> Um, how important it is that you listen to what we say to you because we're teaching you the truth. And they're not. So listen to us. Don't listen to them. That's exactly what you tell, right? Have some some um, jo- Mormons or Jehovah Witnesses come up to people in your church and just sit in the other and start to take them away. You say, don't listen to them, Right? Don't let them in your house anymore. Right? You listen to what we're saying. This is the truth. Notice what we're doing. We're taking you to the Bible. Well, they're doing the tomb too. Well, the, first of all, the, they have the wrong kind of Bible, maybe. And second of all, uh, they, they are twisting the Scripture. All right? That's what you would do. Okay? Withdraw from their fellowship. We've already read it. 1 John 2.19, right? Went out from us because they were not of us. And they went out from us because they weren't of us. So we need to withdraw from their fellowship. Why? Because they are false. Notice their proselyting efforts. We've already looked at it to some degree in chapter 2 again. That whole 19 and following is huge. Um... But verse 21, I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it and because no lie is of the truth. What is he saying? They're lying. Okay, Black and white stuff, huh? Who is a liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. As for you, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you have heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise which he made uh, uh, himself made to us eternal life. These things I have written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. And as for you, the anointing which you have received from him abides in you and you have no need for anyone to teach you but as, but as his anointing teaches you about all things and it is true and is not a lie. And just as it has taught you, you abide in him. Yeah. Question for you on verse 22 when it says, Who is the liar but the one who denies Jesus is Christ? They're still talking, he's still talking about false teachers, correct? Mm-hmm. Not just an unbeliever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> they're, they're worse than the unbeliever. They right, are that, teachers. Right, exactly. Okay. So I just want to make sure. Yeah, they, right. they are teachers of this. They are propagating this, mm-hmm. John. Was this one, was this book written in direct. I guess, in opposition to um, Gnosticism? Well, Gnosticism really doesn't come full-blown until the 2nd century. But we would call the, the, the beginnings of Gnosticism. Uh, 
uh, incipient, they call it incipient Gnosticism. The beginning of wasn't full blown, but that's what they do. They deny the, the Christ. So that's typic Gnostic, but others would do it too. But yes, this is the beginning, the beginnings of Gnosticism that come full blown second century and into the third that the early church fathers had to deal with. It's, it is hideous. All right. They stress the pre existence of Christ to the downplay of the humanity of Christ. Boy, are we get into Christology? <coughs> yeah, we are. Chapter 4, verse 2. By this you know that the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that, that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, is from God. Okay. And verse 3. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist of which you have heard that is coming. And now it is already in the world. And the spirits here again are false teachers, correct? The spirits? Yeah. Um, <coughs> and every spirit that it, does it, not confess. Uh, yeah. It could... It, 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 it could be also spirits that are working through false teachers too. Okay. Okay. I wouldn't just leave it, you know, with the spirits, right. but could be incarnate in the ones whom they're getting this from. They, John would definitely, uh, when he says they are the Antichrist, the demonic spirits are involved in these deceiving uh, um, uh, false teachers. All right. Um, num- let's see. They proselyte. They. Um, I, I hadn't read the. I haven't been reading the Second John, but we've read almost all of Second John already. Um, number five. John seems to indicate they claim some or all of the following: fellowship with God. Hear me. Okay. Once you understand that John is fighting false teachers, this taints the entire book. Okay? And if you don't put it in there, you can come up with things that are not, in my opinion, not what John's talking about. So when he says, if we say, why? This is what these false teachers are saying. Are you with me? If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. For John walking in darkness means you're lost. (laughs) Okay. We lie and do not practice the truth. Wow. So some of these teachers will say, we have fellowship with God. We know God. Chapter 2, verse 4. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not any. We know God. Yeah, bro? One of the things I hate when people say is, God knows my heart. (laughs) (laughs) And my rebuttal to them always is, but does your heart know God? Yes, sir. That's excellent. That is excellent. Does your heart know God? Yeah. And every time it handcuffs them. Yeah, because they, they like to, to live in those that, that, that gray area yeah. so much that they're not really making a decision so I'm like does your, you know, your heart knows God if God knows your heart, okay, does your heart know God yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. amen but, brother. You, but you mean in that context because God does know your heart yes, 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 in that context yeah, yeah they say they abide in God verse 6, notice how hideous this is The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. Whoa. Now, when you teach 1 John and you don't go through these things I'm going through, and even if you do, you're going to constantly be fighting somebody who says, well, I know somebody who knows God and they're doing this, this, this. How can you say these are false teachers and this, that, and the other? I'm saying uh, if you want to talk about that, you need to go to 1 Corinthians. 
because that's where the carnality comes in. John is not dealing with carnal believers, okay, who have problems with walking with God. We, he's got a problem of false teachers who say they know God. Professing believers, right? Yeah, they yeah. They profess to know God. They say, I know God. They don't say I profess to know God. Know. We would. They just say, I know God. Can we ask them which God? Yeah. And remember, it's, it's a God that doesn't say that Jesus came in the flesh. It, denying Christ. So, so they're denying part of Christology in here. Though they believe he's God. Hey, hey. So, so they can say they know God. Uh, they can say they have fellowship with God. They will say that they abide in God. Uh, they, they are to be born of God. Chapter 3, verse 9 and 10. No one who's born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him and he cannot sin because he's born of God. By this the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God nor the one who does not love his brother. Now what is the first question you're going to get from people when you, when you read this text? Who's born of God? Who's going to be born of God? Who, I sin. You can't say that. that yeah, I, I, I've done that. Well, how can you say I'm not a believer? Right. And you just kind of, you just going to have to say. Now, remember, the context of this letter is not about carnal Christians or Christians that are not obeying God. Okay, go to First Corinthians on that one. In this context, in this background, we're looking at false teachers. John makes it clear. Are you with me? So you, you, you. This is a, a classic illustration of you have to know why an author is writing and to whom he's writing and why. So that you might place his writings in the proper way. But you'll get it even when you have a good introduction. You will constantly get it. So I always, when I to- teach First John in a, in a class or something like that, I'm, every, every beginning of the class I go over it again. It's like some of them in the class go, you're going to say that again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> because there's some people come in and don't, not been in class before. Remember, the context of this letter is, and go through this, that, and the other. So when he says these things, he's not looking at a carnal Christian. If you want to do that, go to 1 Corinthians. All right. All right. Uh, and they say they love God. In 420, uh, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he cannot see. Notice how black and white John is because of the situation of the letter and what he's facing. Okay. Yeah, bro. But it's just like you said, I mean, they're pretty crafty because now they say, say, a Mormon or a Jehovah's Witness or even someone who's a Muslim they say I believe in Jesus mm-hmm. and then when you ask them well what's your definition of Jesus and you realize it's not the same yeah it's not it's Jesus in the Bible right. that's right yeah. but they'd like to say that because hey I believe in Jesus yeah. that's like those billboards that used to be around Houston right <laughs> Muslims yeah. and Christians we believe in the same Jesus yeah. oh yeah oh yeah. I, 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 yeah 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 I do I, rem- I heard about yeah, them yeah. I, don't, I didn't see them mm-hmm. so All right. John never names any specific sin of the opponents. He only warns in the letter about walking in darkness, not acknowledging sin, not keeping the commandments, not following the examples of Christ, and committing sin. This is typical of these people. Not keeping the commandments. Not acknowledging their sin. Now, um, notice they fail to love their brothers and sisters. 1 John 4, 20 and 21. We already looked at 20. 
and 21 is this. So, thus, in conclusion, I would say the opponent, opponents of the author of 1 John are, uh, are, gis, are schematics from uh, with, from with, from with? Okay, Within. sorry. Within is what you're saying. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Within the author's own community who have put forward a Christology which the author has judged unacceptable. The Christology of the opponents appears to minimize the importance of the earthly career of Jesus, including his sacrificial death on the cross in the plan of salvation. Now, which has produced in the opponents or in the judgment of the author of 1 John will inevitably produce in the opponents a moral indifferentism in which the ethical value of one's behavior and deeds as a Christian is minimized and sin committed after conversion do not need to be confessed. I suspect, though I cannot conclusively prove that the opponents held a high Christology which went beyond the reflected what, what, that, that reflected in the Gospel of John to the point of saying that it was the act of the incarnation itself uh, which had redemptive value for Christians. Not the sacrificial death of Jesus on the cross. There are lots of similarities between this portrait of the opponents and Christian forms of Gnosticism found later in the mid to second century, more so than Docetism in my judgment. That was from Hall Harris. Okay. Now, so it is my conclusion, uh, Dr. Harris also uh, agrees with me. Dr. Harris is uh, a Dallas Theological Seminary professor of New Testament Greek and his specialty is in John. Um, and I just happen to agree with him. <laughs> so I'm using it. And I believe there, there is two competing purposes for the first John. Some say that the, the purpose is fellowship with God so they would take all these passages as not having fellowship with God or having fellowship with God. Or, uh, like I take it in uh, Dr. Harris, Hall Harris, is that it deals with assurance of salvation. So John is writing so that these can understand the, how you can be assured of your salvation. Now, if you have people dragging people away into believing Christ and in a different gospel, I want you to know if that's the, if that's the heresy that you have to fight in your church, you're going to have people in your church not knowing whether they're saved. Well, this group says this. And you guys say this. I don't know what's true. So what does John do? He writes a very affirmative, dogmatic letter of how you can have assurance of salvation. How's that? Okay. If you're looking for carnality, don't look for that in this book. Because that's not what he's that's not his issue. That's not how he's writing. He's saying there's a whole bunch of confused people out there. And he needs to tell them. What, how they may know they have eternal life. They may have assurance. Now, let me ask you a question. Can you be unassured whether you are saved and be saved? Yes. Yeah, you can. Can you be sure you'll be saved and lost? I think so. Some people are deceiving themselves. Have you been witnessing? I say to them, you going to heaven? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Are you sure? Yeah, sure. How, why, why are you going? I'm a pretty good person. Yeah. 
That person is assured he's going, but he's not. But most of the time, a believer is assured that he's going because he is a believer, okay? But sometimes we got these other parts, okay? So, yeah. Uh, I, was, I was talking to uh, actually uh, my cousin uh, back home, and uh, it was a funeral of this this uh, uh, gentleman that uh, we grew up. But anyway, he, he was 73 years old, and he died, and he was just talking about how people came up and they spoke just great things about him, how good he was, a good mechanic, good this, good that. And the sad thing, he lived all his life and didn't know Christ. <sighs> 73 years old. And but he was a good person. But he was a good person, person. right. In the sense of his, the Christian you, morality you, affected his life. Right. And, and, and his wife know a lot got up and said uh, that she was, had been, you know, thinking about what she could say and asking God, what could, you know, what could she say? She was a believer? She was a believer. Okay. Cause that's, 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 she was a believer. I was wondering. And... She got up and she said, uh, I guess what you, like, this kind of pertaining to what you, what you was just saying, that uh, she used the thief on the cross. That we don't know whether or not uh, he's saved because we don't know at the last minute right. if he sure. ex- accepted Christ or not. That's true. Well, that is true. That's true. Of course. That is true. But it's, it's a sad up thing. Up to the point that we knew. Yeah. Up to we the, didn't know. Exactly. <laughs> and the odds are not good. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, the you odds know, are not ex- good. Exactly. Yeah. You know? Now, when we get back from break, I'm going to go through what I call the three-legged stool of assurance of salvation. And the more legs you have, the more solid you is your assurance of your salvation. But even when someone is unassured, he could still be saved, right? Mm -hmm. But he is a confused person and not a very good Christian walker, walking in the Lord. So we'll look at these uh, points, and I got them all from 1 John. How's that? All right? Um, Begin back in, and uh, we left off at break time with... um, <clears throat> what is assurance and this is the book of assurance and I call it the um, three legged stool on, of assurance and I find it in um, oops oops First is your belief in Christ, that you have believed the gospel, that you have placed your trust in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation and not works. Let's look at 1 John chapter 2, 23. When whoever denies the Son does not have the Father, the one who confesses the Son has the Father also. As... For you, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you have heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise which he himself made to us, eternal life. In other words, if you believe in the Son. Okay? So, we have an objective promise test have do we know the gospel and have we placed our trust in it in it alone okay that's usually the first place i turn when somebody doesn't know whether they are saved or not i want to make sure they have the correct knowledge okay if they don't have the correct knowledge they can't be saved right because they're not believing in the right stuff now, you can still have this correct knowledge and not believe in it. Okay? Second of all is what is called the Spirit's witness to the individual. 1 John 3.24 And the one 
who keeps his commandments abides in him, Jesus, and he in him, and we know this, that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. That's the acid test of Paul in Romans 8.16. Just um, turn to Romans 8.16. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Notice verse 9 of the same chapter of Romans. However you are in the flesh, it's not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, but if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Him. And of course, in 1 John four thirteen. By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us because He has given us His Spirit. And Paul says that the Spirit of God witnesses with my spirit that I am a child of God. Okay? That's different from emotions. And when you're a brand new Christian, it becomes very difficult at times to discern that because they can't discern the witness of the Spirit from emotions. They get saved and they're all excited the next morning they wake up. I don't know if I'm saved or not because I don't have the same emotion. But we're talking about a witness of the Spirit. Uh, Justin and then Corey and then... So when we talk about in verse 24 of uh, of chapter 3, the one who keeps his commandments abides in him. What does keep mean there? Because the way that I read that, that is someone who follows his commandments and we're going to break them. So therefore, I do not keep his commandments because I have broken some of them. Yeah, could I save that for uh, a little bit because I'm going to yes. make it worse when we turn to... <laughs> well, then. In other words, the worse than what people... I mean, I, the question okay. that the people have in the third chapter <clears throat> of First of John, and I already read, read it when it says... The one who practices sin is of the devil, or one who is born of God practices one. No one who's born of God practices sin. But he's talking about false teachers there. Yeah, yeah. But we still got to handle. What, what do you mean by that? It's the same thing you just asked there too. Okay. Yeah. All right. So let, let me. I will. Okay. And if I don't, you bring it up again because <laughs> because I, I forgot. Okay, Corey. Well, I was just wondering if you could expand a little bit on Romans um, 8.16. And I guess, I'm, I'm assuming when it says the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God, that this is an assurance with the Spirit or like a confidence with Him? It, it, it is the work of the Spirit that is... that you've experienced in your life that you find all of a sudden you find confidence. Man, you read a passage of Scripture and you just go, man, this is it, man. This is good. That the, 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 the Spirit is constantly witnessing with you uh, from the Scriptures most often uh, or usually, or even if you're not reading the Scriptures, it's something that's scriptural. And you, you, you're, you're the the spirit of God is witnessing that the word and is interacting with you through the word. It's the same kind of thing, but it's different when the illumination of the spirit of God gives you an understanding of a passage. Well, this would be a a, a, a witness that you, you know you did something and you go, man, man, the spirit was really with me there. I mean, I was working with a guy and this, that, and the other, and. He just really, you know, just constantly, always, every place as you're walking with him, the spirit is is a, a giving you all kinds of indications that you're a child of God. By yeah, sometimes it's a confidence, something that's going, wow, man, isn't that something? Or maybe you're singing along and you just, you know, you just, man, 
the Spirit of God just witnesses right there, and you just say, man, that, that song's true. That's, that, that's right out of the Word. Just, it was just, that's just wonderful the way they said it. Or you, you did something, uh, and God directed you, and you, you were prompted to make a phone call, and, uh, and then all of a sudden you make that phone call, and you go, whoa, boy, did they need a, me to call today. Well, the, the, the Spirit of God witnessed to you to make that prompting. And you got all these kind, all these things happening to you all the time as a as a and as you are a mature believer, I hope we don't take them for granted, but you, you you it's something that you experience all the time and you're really thankful for it, but you don't necessarily think about it because it's your everyday thing that happens to you because you're walking with him. <clears throat> when you're brand new, it's it's brand new. And uh sometimes uh you know you don't you know, you experience you can experience the move of the witness of the Spirit of God even when you are, are down. You know what I'm saying? Or your emotions are gone. So it's not, it's not emotions. Though at times when the witness of the Spirit witnessed to me, I do get emotional. You see what I'm saying? But it's, I'm not saying it's the emotions. They just connect with that sometimes. And so... A young believer has trouble with this because he cannot distinguish between the emotions that come from it and the witness of the Spirit itself. And sometimes he can be fooled that, I guess God's not with me anymore. Okay. Now, what happens when you start living in sin on a consistent basis? You... Quenches the spirit. Quenches the spirit. So, do you have the witness of the spirit? No. You, you it, it becomes it becomes very <laughs> very few in betweens, right? You get more convictions than that, but the witness of the spirit doesn't there. And so, I have, as a pastor, on numerous occasions, uh, will come in. They say, "I don't even know what I'm saved or not." I've been living in sin. I've been, I mean, I just, I have been doing well. I don't even know what I'm saved. And I, and I usually say, I don't understand that. Because what has he got? He got a one-legged stool. <clears throat> He's made a profession of faith. That's all he got. He has very little witness of the Spirit. And his, and his works of faith are hardly there at all too, right? So he got, he's got a two-legged stool. He got a one-legged stool. And you remember how... Hard it is to sit down on a long legged stool, right? So I, I say, yeah, I can understand why you do that. I can understand why you you feel like you don't, you know, I say. But if he's a true believer, he's saved, right? I mean, oh, yeah, yeah. Also Remember, do, we've already said that. Yes, okay, but can we say something so I can clarify for my brother here? So say he quits going to church and he quits reading the Word. He's still saved, right? If he's a true believer, I've seen people quit going to church and quit reading the Word and they don't do well. They don't do well, but... They're still a believer. They're still believers. Okay. Now, it's also possible that this person was a professing believer right. and not right. a true believer. Right. Uh-huh. But true believers can quit going to church and quit reading their Bible and quit praying for a while. They get beat up by the Holy Spirit because He's, he's spanking them. Right. And uh, we as, uh, as believers ought to be admonishing them... And uh, but it happens. We often call them carnal Christians, right? I think he just described my life. Was he right? It was good that I was afflicted. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay, so our 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 belief in the objective gospel presentation that I have placed my trust in Him alone as my salvation. Second is the witness that comes from the Spirit because I am a child of God. And then third, that works that flow from faith. Not works. A lot of people have works. But works that flow from a faith. Okay? Look at 1 John 2, 3 through 5. Um, oh, there it is. 
And by this we know that we have come to know Him. If we keep His commandments. The one who says, I have come to know Him and does not keep His commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has truly been brought to maturity, perfected. By this, what he just said, we know that we are in him. Okay? So those works stimulated by the Holy Spirit and faith within is part of the assurance of our salvation. So what happens when you start living in sin? That goes, doesn't it? It becomes to a very minimum. So again, what what happens is you only have a one-legged stool. You have, I, I, I said I, I, I made a profession. That's all I, you know. Because the rest of it is not very loud in your ears. Yeah. Can you give a few examples of the, the, the Spirit's witness, like in prayer life, for instance? Like a few examples. The witness of the Spirit? Yeah, yeah. prayer life. Um, gosh, in almost in every, every daily thing of my life, I have a witness of the Spirit. Either you are doing this mundanely, or you are a fervor in the Spirit, or I am medium, or whatever. I, I, the Spirit is, of God is constantly involved in my life. And the more mature you are and the longer you walk with them, the more that is. You shouldn't take it for granted. Now, just because you've been a, a long-time Christian and walking with Him a long time doesn't mean that you couldn't all of a sudden stop all that and you get uh, uh, start to live in sin. You could do that. But you, you know less likely of mature believers should do that, but there's still a danger. So, the witness of the Spirit with you that you are a child of God is a multitude of things that happens within your life that the Spirit witnesses to you. It involves emotions, but it's not the emotions that I'm looking for. That's a... That's a a, a result or that is something that you respond to because the spirit has so uh, worked or brought this truth to mind that emotions come you know I've been I've been, I've been at home and my wife found one of my one of the powerful songs of, of God comes on and I'm walking up steps I've had at times just fall to my knees I didn't even get the next step I just fell to my knees right there on the steps and just buried my head in the carpet of the, of the steps and praised my Savior. That was prompted by the Spirit. And if I would have not done that, I mean, my wife, that's nothing new for her. She knows I do that all the time. So it's not like I'm showing, you know, I'm at home. And uh, that's, you know, she sees that all the time. So, Hey, for me not to do that when the Spirit is prompting would be negative, right? I don't mean that you have to do that. I'm just saying that's just one illustration of multitudes of things. Conviction of sin, that I didn't speak uh, to my wife, or I wasn't as kind to her, or I I wasn't uh, as sensitive as I wanted to be, or, and I come to confess those to before her, those are the witness of the Spirit. So it can be uh, things that you've done well or to not done well. But there's that constant Spirit of God that is, that is in your life uh, demonstrating that you're a child of God. Great. And so... I have found, there may be another one, but so far those are the three pillars that I've found in the scriptures that are that I share with people about assurance. Do not give anybody assurance of their salvation. Share assurance and let the Spirit of God do it. 
I do not want to give somebody assurance of their salvation who's not saved. That's right. Okay. But I, when somebody comes to me, and I, I can't tell you how many multitudes have, have done that over the years, uh, but especially as a pastor, I begin with, uh, with the gospel. I just say, well, let's look about how. And then I go to the witness of the Spirit, and then I go to uh, how uh, mm. they are demonstrating their faith by uh, their working out their salvation with fear and trembling. Okay. I believe that's what John is speaking about here. That's why he makes this, these black and white statements about you can't do this and you're doing this and therefore you're saved. Because the issue here is that you have um, uh, false teachers that have split the church up and, and there is confusion of who Christ is and how you get salvation. So you can imagine, people go, well, how do I know I'm saved? Well, then John starts giving all those things so that they can give assurance of salvation in that context. Okay? All right. I think that's it. We haven't got into the book yet. But... Here is my outline that I adapted from Hebert. An introduction, of course, assurance of salvation through the test of fellowship through chapter 1, 5 to 2, 17. The assurance of salvation in the conflict of faith, 2, 18 through 4, 6. The assurance of salvation from the evidence of love, 4, 7 to 5, 3. Assurance of salvation from the witness of the Spirit, uh, 5, 6 through 12. And conclusion, the key to assurance is Christ, 13 through 21 of chapter 5. Okay? All right. Yeah? I have a question. <clears throat> that anything the devil ever... Um, initiates has to be by definition absolutely against God. Is that right? Correct? Mm -hmm. I mean, he's not, God can turn it around for, for his glory for good, but the devil, anything he initiates has to be 100% against God. Yeah. At all now, times. That's it becomes, the question. It becomes hideous when he uses mm -hmm. scripture in a false or in an ungodly way or in a way that is not in its proper context yeah. that fools people and causes them to have problems. For example, Matthew 12, the, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, which cannot happen in this life because Jesus is not here, he's not presenting the kingdom, and the kingdom is not rejected. That's what happened to that generation. But I've had numerous people come to me and saying, uh, you know, I, I blaspheme the Holy Spirit, so I, I, I'm, I got to go to, uh, I'm going to hell. There's, not, there's no help for me, so I'm just going to live like the devil. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can't be hey, saved. Well, I would do the same thing if you could be saved, right? Right, I mean, you can't be saved. Enjoy just live it up. You're on the highway to hell. I mean, I've, I've had people on numerous cases, but when I, when I, but these people were were indeed believers. Yeah. <laughs> and God wouldn't let them go whole hog into sin. They were getting spanked. Mm -hmm. But they were doing great damage to their to their to their life and when this was lifted they they wanted to know the truth about everything. But but he always has he always has to have hundred percent an evil agenda, and even if he's to, he is, uh, uh, he will use the word for evil agenda. He, he can be ca camouflaged as an angel of, of of light, but ultimately his agenda gives him away. Yeah, I mean, remember the second temptation of Jesus. 
He, he, the devil quotes quotes scripture. Yeah. Yeah. And if you if you check it, he left some things out. Right. Out of context. And yeah. therefore, really important yeah. from the context that they were talking about. Yeah. So, what I'm saying is, we often think about when the devil used something that is so evil and terrible. Oh yeah, there's a whole bunch of that out there. But he also can use the very thing that you think is good. The scripture in the wrong way to cause a believer who's ignorant of the scriptures, which ends up being evil. Because the question was, is, does the devil ever further the kingdom of God? Yeah. Yeah, My yeah. answer was, not, not intentionally. Not, not intentionally. <clears throat> he, can't, he, he, he may end up doing it indirectly. And, I, and the example I gave him was, well, the devil did the Holocaust, but then God turned around and from that Holocaust came the, uh, the formation of Israel. Yes. Into the yes. Yeah. yeah. And uh, we could start, uh, we can right. see that in Scripture, Isaiah 10, right, sure. dealing with Assyrians, and, right. and all, yeah, all the, yeah. <clears throat> God, <clears throat> Proverbs 16, 4, right? Right. right. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, he's made all things, even, even the, the evil the, from the day of evil. Yeah. So he's in control of it all to bring it to a good. So he doesn't make evil for evil, but he takes evil to bring to good. Right. And the devil, since he's evil, he uses him. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. I talked about that actually on Sunday evening with the youth group, talking about Jonah. You know, he used Jonah in a bad way, but on the way, he had a whole boat full of sailors that got saved. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I always say... Well, Nineveh did too. Well, yeah, but we only did chapter one. <laughs> yeah, okay, we didn't mention that. <laughs> oh, that's good, Justin. That's good. I like that chapter one. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> that's good. That's good. All right. Still got another three weeks to okay. do the other three. Okay. okay. More saving coming up. <laughs> Salvation's on the way. Salvation's on the way. All right. Let's see here. Um, Well, let's look at First John chapter uh, um, one first. We're going to get into First John two because I'm sure you're going to ask me the question, so I'll measure, make sure. But in First John chapter one, um, notice how John goes back from uh, back and forth. It, saying what the Bible says and then saying, if we say. So he's saying, he's saying in uh, verse 5, the truth, and in verse 6, 8, and 10, he's using the words of the false teachers as illustrations of what is false. So it's, True, false teachers say this, but this is true, false teachers say this, this is true, false teachers say this. Okay? So let's look at it. And this is the message which we've heard from him, Jesus, and announced to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. So don't put darkness in God. He's, there isn't sin. Okay? If we say, now, why does he use that phraseology? Because that's what the, that the false teachers are saying. So he's saying, if we say, like the false teachers say, that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. And that's what they're doing. Don't fall for it. But, if we walk, now he's telling them what the truth is. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And I'm saying to myself, hallelujah, right? Now, notice I thought he would say, but if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we'd have fellowship with him who's in the light. But he skips to, a, to the, all the way to, to the next step. He, he said, well, that'd be obvious. 
But if you are one who fellowship with God, then you will also fellowship with your brother. Why does he do that? Because they're not doing that. They're not fellowshipping with them. And that cleanses you from all sin. But if we say, like the false teachers say, that we have no sin, hmm, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. So they're saying, we don't sin. <laughs> okay? And then he says, if, then he goes back to the truth. If we confess our sin, because we're going to sin, <laughs> He is faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say, like the false teachers, that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So don't believe him. <laughs> so, placing this in the context of the false teachers constantly helps you to understand why John says what he says to the people who are facing such things. Alright? Now, when you come to 1 John chapter 2, verse uh, 1 and 2, you, you come in... Yeah, bro. So, um, so, the, so the beginning part of this First four verses is basically kind of what Paul is doing to the Galatians, right? He's kind of like defending his uh, apostleship because there were false teachers. So the first four verses, John is kind of doing the same thing, right? Hey, I, we saw it from the beginning with our own eyes, so and the false teachers didn't. So we, he came in flesh because I, yeah, so, I felt him. So he's kind of using his. Uh, apostleship, his authority as an apostle to, to kind of... Oh, yeah. Right? And, he, and notice how he says in verse 1, <laughs> we've seen him. He's no phantom. Okay? And we, we with our own eyes, we, we beheld his hands. Yes. We've touched him. We've handled him. You know? He wasn't some kind of uh, docetic God or person who wasn't really real. We touched him. We handled him. We walk with him. I'm able to put my arm around him. Well, that would be something. Mm -hmm. That'd be hard for me. I'd have to fall on my face. <laughs> <laughs> so, do we know much about the false teachers? Were, I mean, were they incipient Gnostics? As far as we can, they, you know, they're denying all kinds of stuff, but they don't believe he came <clears throat> in the flesh. So they weren't uh, like Judaizers or anything. Like that? Uh, if they are, they're, they're weird yeah. ones. Okay. You know what I mean? Because yeah, I, I was reading around. I, I mean, I'm not saying that, that a Jew couldn't be a Gnostic, but yeah, they yeah. could. Yeah. But the, it's Gnostic, whatever it is. It's not Jewish per se, it's Gnostic. It's not, and may, may I be careful here, because I want, you know, scholars would, would, would joust me. It's not full blown Gnosticism. That doesn't come in until the second century. So it's 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 just the beginnings of it, which shows that the evil one has this in mind from the beginning to do this kind of thing to, to try to mess up who Neo, Jesus is. Neoplatonism, basically. Yeah. Because kind of. yeah, yeah. Now, uh, now, was the audience are they Jewish of Jewish background? And just because I was, because you know how it says Paul, you know, was a minister to the Gentiles, and Peter, John, and James to the Jews, and, that, and Acts it says that, and I think, and and basically every book that every general epistle has kind of been to the Jews, I think, from what I've read. Well, so I'm missing something. Well, there, every every letter is to a church. Okay. But not necessarily directly to Jews. No, no but you see what I'm saying. But it could be addressing the Jewish people. With, uh, Gentiles and Jews are addressed in a letter. Okay. That's probably better to say. Okay. On that. 
Okay. Um, in uh, little children, I am writing these things to you that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have a, a, an advocate, right? A lawyer with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not ours only, but also for those of the whole world. Now, we get into the... But the whole world there is only the elect. We're going to, to look at that, and that's okay. what I want to, to look at, uh, so that we might be able to, to see. Uh, you don't have to take my position, but I'm going to give you my position. No, How's yeah, that? No, I'm, okay. I'm interested in it. Okay. Um, there are different views of the atonement, and I have a whole bunch more, but um, these are the popular ones down through the ages that are still with us to this day um, the Abelardian view which is that Jesus died to provide a good example for us typical liberals take this um, uh, a Grodian would be that uh, Jesus died to sustain God's moral universe which was going against sin uh, against the order of morality Typical also, again, of more liberal view. The Anselmic view is more of Anselm of the 1100s, which is becomes the basis, again, for the penal substitutionary view, which I believe is the, the correct view of the atonement. Man's problem uh, is sin, and a substitute is to die for him and to bear the penalty for man's sin. That's more what is typically called an Anselmic view <coughs> from Anselm, but Anselm was not as clear as we have writings of later times. Okay? So you have the Anselmic view of Lutherans, Calvins, Arminians, Wesleyans, and Ar Ar Amaralians, and you have... Uh, the Abelardian view of, of basically being a good of Socinians, Unitarians, and religious liberals. I hate to just throw all this out to you without explaining all of it, but don't have time. We've been through the tulip thing, so we, we uh, now we're dealing with uh, basically number three. How should we look at the atonement? The Arminian is what is called the uh, there are more views than the Arminian view and there are several views among the Arminian view I, this is not a historical uh, view that we could go through though I could go through all of them Christ's redeeming work made it possible for everyone to, to be saved but did not actually secure the salvation of anyone Although Christ died for all men and for every man, only those who believe on him are saved. His death enabled God to pardon sinners on the condition that they believe. But it did not actually put anyone up, uh, sin. That didn't actually pay for anyone's sin, as it put. Christ's redeem, redemption becomes effective only if man chooses to accept it. Where the Calvinist view would be that Christ's redeeming work was intended to save the elect only and actually secure the salvation for them. His death was a substitutionary endurance of the penalty of sin in the place of certain specific sinners. In addition to putting away the sins of his people, Christ's redemption secured everything necessary for the salvation, including faith which unites them to him. The gift of faith is infallibly applied by the Spirit to all for whom Christ died, therefore guaranteeing 
their salvation. And that's typical of two positions on the atonement. So, Calvinism and Armenian debate. Salvation is accomplished through the combined efforts of God, the Armenians say, who takes the initiative, and man who must respond. Man's response being the determining factor. Okay. God has provided salvation for everyone. <clears throat> but if his provision becomes effective only for those who, by their own free will, choose or cooperate with him and accept his offer of grace, at the critical point, Man's will plays the, the, a decisive role. Thus man, not God, determines who will be the recipients of the gift of salvation. Now, that's not exactly how they would say it, but that's what it ultimately comes to. Okay. All right? In other words, if I push my Arminian friends... I say, you know, well, God, God elects, okay, okay, he elects, okay, but who, did, I mean, what makes the determining factor here? Okay, God may do 99% of the work to bring the person to that, and you couldn't be saved unless he did the 99%, but you, you're still lost, right? Mm, yeah. Well, then, that part you do, God can't touch, because you tell me if he does, it's not free. I say, okay, is that right? Yeah. Right, free will. Okay, okay. Then that one percent is yours. Right? They don't want to say that, but I don't know what else to say. One percent of your salvation is yours, or whatever percent you want to call it. Five, one point five. I don't <laughs> care what you put it on it. Whatever, right? <laughs> yeah, but whatever percent it is you want to put on it, you got it, because that's the determining factor. Because if God touches it. If you, pr I don't even want to see how an Armenian can pray. How can you pray to ask God to do something else if the God doesn't want to do, to, to do it? You're going to violate his free will? Is that what you're going to do? Okay, I've heard people, preachers say, well, God's done everything you can do, and I've done everything I can do. Now, Justin, would you close in prayer? And you kind of go, well, if God's done everything he can do, and he's done everything he can do, and I don't know what else I could do, what am I doing praying? Who am I praying to him? Right. Are you with me? Yeah. But, but they, we usually pray, God, do something else, right? But then how do they get around Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 about the gift of God, that it's none of your own works? I mean, they'd have to get around that <clears throat> passage, right? Well, first of all, many of them have thought of it. Those who have okay. will, will try to argue uh, grammatically that the demonstrative neuter pronoun in that sentence does not go back to the feminine faith or grace. So therefore it couldn't be uh, that faith is a gift. That is a gift from God. Can't refer back because it doesn't have the correct... Um, we're, we're dealing with syntax, okay, yeah. in grammar. Um, it, it doesn't go back to, this, to singular and the correct gender of the noun for which it refers. Now, the problem is, is they, in my opinion, is that if you study Paul in his syntactical uses of grammar, many cases, I can show you three, uh, where in Ephesians, he uses a neuter to go back to a phrase. So when he wants to use a, a, a refer a, a, a previous reference, and it's not one word, he'll use a neuter. So, in that so way, therefore, I'm saying it refers not to grace and not to faith, but both of them to the phrase, so he had to use a neuter. So that would be consistent with his style of writing within the same book. Yes. Right. But then my second part of the question is this. If based on what you're saying here of their own free will, and then the second part where it says man's will plays a decisive role, then you could not have eternal security with this Cor view. Yes. Okay. Uh, they do at times. But how, how, 
I don't see how that could be. It's not I, I know you're thinking logically through that. Th oh, this, that, but I'm saying, well, <laughs> I'm just saying, just like, how can an Arminian tell me <clears throat> that God foreknows something, but He doesn't predestine it? Yeah. It, it, it is a logical. It is an illogical conclusion, but they they understand that those who are theologians and just say that is a tension in theology that we cannot understand. But, but they does, have to have it or they don't have their system. Doesn't that also violate the sovereignty of God then? If they, well, they, they would say it, that the same thing. They would be they'd be the same thing. They if God foreknows something but he doesn't predestine it, just that and the other uh, they say that's a tension in theology and the, the scripture doesn't tell us but it's there. It's, it's, that's part of their conclusion. But it doesn't make sense that God would depend on us for yeah. this. I, I'm trying to be as honest as I can with <laughs> Arminians that I've read so that I'm not mischaracterizing them. Yeah, bro? Do they have uh, both views with all Scripture supporting each view? Uh, any word of reference? I've gotten in trouble with people... Uh, when I say that the Arminian view of the will is a philosophical declaration for which then they place scripture upon it. But when I read them, that's exactly what, I mean, I had a brand new book out, in, well, not brand new, but like five years ago, whatever. And that's what he does. He says, I believe in free will. And, it, and he makes a philosophical argument, not scriptural argument. And then he says, uh, that's what we understand because God would not be uh, just. Do, just in doing it any other way. And he makes this philosophical argument and then he starts using scripture that would come from it. Where a Calvinist won't do that. He, he, he has verses where he can yeah. turn to. And, and I guess that's what I'm saying is, like I've been doing a lot of meditation meditating on Romans 8 through 9 um, because I want to come to my own solid conclusion on this um, but do they have like I said resources where say the Armenian view they have every scripture supporting why they have that view oh yeah and it's a long debate but, I mean you could spend yeah. years yeah. reading their books but what happens is you <clears throat> When you read them, you you come to the, you say, okay, okay, I've, oh yeah, I know that argument, I know that one, and then there may be a few little tweaks here and there. Because Romans eight through nine seems pretty cut and dry. <laughs> you can't read it any other way. I, I I've come to that conclusion, but but I, I want to be sensitive to my Arminian friends. But then you read this in First John, where it says for, for the whole world as well, and you're like, well, you know, let's get this right. Okay, well let's look at it then. Uh, the Calvinists. Salvation is accomplished by the almighty power of the triune God. Did you hear that? The triune God. There's no difference between the Trinity here. The Father chooses a people. The Son dies for them. And the Holy Spirit makes Christ's death effective by bringing the elect to faith and repentance. The, the, the Trinity is in harmony with this view thereby causing them to willingly see we don't say that people don't will is that who makes them willing yeah. mm -hmm. okay so by this uh, the bringing the elect to faith and repentance therefore causing them to willingly obey the gospel the entire process, election, redemption, regeneration, is the work of God and it is by grace alone. Thus, God, not man, determines who will be the recipient of the gift of salvation. Yeah. Can I, can I say, like, from a, if I think from an Armenian perspective, that before, if here was creation, and before creation, God did not depend on anybody. I think everybody would agree on that. A whole. And then he chooses, okay, I'm going to create. And then afterwards, if, if I have a, a true free will, like like I, man can choose, that would mean God depends on man. 
And if, if I assume that, that would then mean that God has changed, which cannot be. Okay, this is where they would say to you, God knows, for knows, but he hasn't predestined. But that means he dep- would depend. They would say no. That's a mystery how that can be, that God can know something that, that he hasn't determined. It is it's it is a... That God can know something that he hasn't determined? Yeah. It is completely... Uh, I, I mean, I can't get my... I, I can't that's logically... That sense. That's like gobbledygook. That's like, that's black, but no, it's really white. What? They will say it's a mystery. What's <clears throat> well, a mystery? It's all up for grabs. Pardon me? I say it's all up for grabs. We yeah, well... The, it's in God's control in some way, but it isn't. Yeah. They want to... They... Uh, uh, my... I play on the, the foreknowledge. I said, is there ever a time when God didn't know it? And they go, oh, no, no, he always knew it. I said, well, was it certain to happen? Because God knows all the possibilities and probabilities, right? Not just what will happen, but could happen, might happen. And he didn't choose it, in my opinion. He didn't predestine it. But he, he would know all the possibilities, right? I say, okay, so he knew this event... Was it certain to happen? And if they say yes, it was certain to happen. Well, that's omniscience, right? That's omniscience. Okay. Then I say to them, if 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 that is the case, um, then what was there ever a time he didn't know it? I just want. I'm just trying to make sure. He, oh yeah, he always knew it. He always knew it. And I said, it was certain to happen. It was certain to happen. Yeah, certain to happen. So I said, okay. What? Uh, and no one outside that did it. He did it, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He, he knew that. Just all that. He knew exactly what's going to happen. I said, okay. What's the difference between a, a knowledge that is certain and predestination? There isn't. There isn't. There isn't. There isn't. There isn't. <laughs> So that's, I say, well then, I mean, if you, if you can tell me that God foreknew it by his omniscience, and it was certain to happen, not any other way, it couldn't have been happening. Now, they, they want to say they look, God looked down through the quarters of time. What did, he, what did they just do? They just put God in time. Yeah. Now, I believe God knows time, but he's not confined by time. He doesn't have to look down through the corridors of time to determine what would happen. See that you were going to have faith, so I choose you. That's why I ask him, was it, did he know that by his omniscience? If they don't, then they have trouble with omniscience. If it's certain to happen, because God knows all things, not just what's going to happen, but what could have happened. If it is certain that that would happen, it could not change. I said, can it change? Okay. Well, God, you mean God didn't know he was going to change? I mean, if it's certain to happen, it can't change. Was there ever a time when he didn't know? No, he always knew. I, just, I say, well, how can a, a, a knowledge that is certain and it won't change be anything else but predestination? That's right. I mean, I, I just can't get my head around it. It just doesn't make sense from a logical yeah. framework. Isn't, yeah. it their, isn't it their desire to hold on to their humanity that they have some role to play in this? Is that well, what you're looking at? Yeah, I, 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 I can appreciate them wanting to make sure man is responsible because they will hit me and say, well, if the way you hold it, your position, man can't be a responsible agent. He's just a robot. Yeah. And then I have to deal with that. And I say, no, we have, we have a will. We have a thinking and a, 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 not just a, a, a machine. You know, I make decisions. According to our nature. According to our nature. I have a question. I was having a conversation with a friend. That was yesterday. Oh, wow. Uh, and we were talking about this. And I, I posed a question. I said, what in your did this with, one, with making you choose life? If you're, if, if, if you're if we're if we're born or we're, we're we're dying in this sinful life that we're living, what makes us choose life? What in you would make you choose life if all you've ever known is sin and death? What what, what makes you to to want to choose that? And his response was, "Well, I get to a point where I realize I need God." And I said, "Okay." I said, "Well, 
Is that God that, that got, brought that revelation to you or did you come up with it on your own? And his response was, I came up with, I, I eventually got to the point where I realized I needed that. How do I respond from I respond with scripture. First of all, I would take him to say, I want to, to you to know what a man is according to scripture. And 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 14 is one of the first texts I would always turn people to. What am I doing right now, uh, Chris? I am painting the picture of who man is from uh, his sinful condition. 1 Corinthians 2 14 says, but the natural man the unbelieving man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for they are foolishness to him and he can not understand. He doesn't have the ability to understand it. It's not that he just doesn't do it. He does that. He's not even able to do it. You got that? Yes, sir. So he has inability because they are spiritually appraised. Then I will turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 1. And it says, And you were dead in your transg- uh, transgression and sin. You didn't need any help. you dead. I mean... And then I usually do this stupid little illustration. I said, hey, I, I, you know, I want to be respectful for the dead, but if you go down to the funeral home to somebody you knew who's, who's laid in rest in his casket, dead, and you preach the most uh, uh, persuasive gospel that has ever been preached on the face of the earth, give the greatest invitation that has ever been given to, to, uh, in the world to this in, individual laid out, he will not respond. Because he's dead. <laughs> so how does a dead man, how, how does a, a person who is alive but dead spiritually uh, is described? Paul describes him in chapter 4 of this book, Ephesians, when he says, um, verse 17. This I say therefore and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And they have become callous having been uh, given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. That's what a person is. Born, they may have a three-piece suit and have six figures, but that's how they are if they're, if they're not a believer. So how, how in the world can a dead man believe? He can. His, his free will is... I don't want it. Because you act according to your nature. And your nature is, I, I don't understand this. I don't care for it. I'm not going to do it. It comes out in different ice cream flavors of how people don't like things or sinfulness or whatever. But uh, an unbeliever knows how to be an unbeliever. That's all they know. That's all they know. That's all they know. But when God opens their hearts... Their eyes are open, the will is then thrown away, and then they say, oh my goodness, yeah. I believe. But nothing about what you did. Yeah, because there was life given you yeah. from a dead state. And then you believed. But who made you willing? God. God made you willing. Me and my kids have a, a, a thing we do when we drive. We look, like to look at bumper stickers and different things. And I saw one that said, you know what? God is never surprised that you are <laughs> That's right. That's right. Good. Good. Do you think, um, just real quick, say there's somebody like my older sister. Uh-huh. Um, so there's, it, it, there's, you can talk to her about the Word of God, and you'll see that she's very polite. <laughs> That's wonderful. Very loving, but you'll see yeah. that uh, it's just talking to a brick wall. Yeah. It, it, it's not being received. No understanding. Everything the Word describes right there. And if you're truly concerned about their salvation, 
would something like Romans 8 or 9 be, it's a very controversial topic. No, I, I don't go there with unbelievers yeah. unless they take me there. I just give them the gospel. Would it be something to present to them to consider that maybe that would cause them to open their eyes to say, you know, am it, I, am I it usually person? causes the ones that I've had to get on the subject cause more confusion. Right. Instead of just saying, what you need to do is believe. I realize, me saying that to her, that she's not able to do it unless God is pleased to open her eyes. But he does it when I, as an individual, begin to confront somebody about the gospel and tell them that they need to believe. And then it is when, if they are the elect, God in his timing will open their eyes and use your words or somebody else's words to be able to say, oh my goodness. Uh, this would be a little heavy for an unbeliever. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I don't... No, I, I just stay with the gospel. Well, we see, we see it all the time. It's like we get pastors that come up there. Not pastors. Some, sometimes it's not just pastors. It's guys that want to come teach Debo's at the foundation. And some of them are um, um, hell fire and brimstone. Mm-hmm. And you'll see a bunch of uh, combat veterans angry. They don't understand it. They don't get it. The message is too, tough, too hard uh, for somebody in that state, I think. Yeah, and you know, I've seen, I've seen, I've seen how far guys and get mad, and all of a sudden, next time it happens, they come to faith. I'm not saying that. I think, I think we ought to tell tell them the truth, and tell you I love you, no matter whether you accept it or not. I'm not, you know, I, I, I'm I, I'm convinced this is the truth, and if you're not, that's fine. So that I have another chance. If you if you back your dump truck your dump truck up and you and you unload, that may be the last time you you get a dump truck. This is a preach salvation, not condemnation. That's correct. Well, you've got to tell them that this is life and death in my understanding, and that it's between heaven and hell. But you can say it in the way. If they say, "Are you angry because of how I said it?" I want to apologize. If it's what I say, I can't apologize because that's what God's telling me. And they can, if they can see that, that you're not trying by your words to be offensive, but the message itself is offensive, then be mad at God. <laughs> he can take it. Yeah. I have a quick question. So we look at the three pillars of assurance. Yes, sir. Belief in Christ, the spirit of goodness, and the work of the faith. Yeah, yes. Work of faith. Work of faith, I'm sorry. So if I'm on my deathbed and I'm dying and I believe, then how do you, how do you, is there a correlation to that? I mean, or, because you don't have a life to live. Yeah. To, for you, these, the work, the work you did was what you professed. Yes. Okay. Okay. It didn't say how much. Okay. <laughs> yeah, the work. Okay. Yeah, bro. <laughs> okay, and, and, and before we get to verse two. Yes, sir. Uh, regarding, you know, kind of been on this thing about free will, right? Yes, sir. God, He's the initiator. He's the one who gives us the will. Correct. He He tickles my willer, and how He does that? He tickles my what? <laughs> my willer. <laughs> That's how, make sure that's on tape there. That's, uh, <laughs> that's not original for me. Dr. G- Donald Gray Barnhouse used to say that. <laughs> okay. um, um, is by changing there. who I am, my nature or my heart. Uh-huh. Out of my heart, my I will things. Out of my nature, I will things. Mm-hmm. And when my nature is changed, that's why regeneration is giving me life. Yes. And the moment I'm given life, I, that's my new nature, which is I yes. can't help but choose. Yes, I, right. That's what. Why now I can say yes, and I will say yes, is because He has given me life. I, my eyes, my whole orientation is different now. Mm-hmm. Okay, can I go for it? I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try this, I'm, I, and I'm going way back <laughs> to Genesis. Uh-huh. Adam was created in holiness, uh-huh. in the image and in the likeness of God. Mm-hmm. 
And when he ate of the forbidden fruit, mm -hmm. is that he did that out of his free will? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Of course. It, right. We can do things. Good, right? Um, we can choose Adam never had a, when he was born, he was born in righteousness. Right. So therefore he was born alive, mm -hmm. spiritually. Mm -hmm. But he was in probation. We know that because he fell. Mm -hmm. And so therefore they, that's the terminology <clears throat> that theologians and biblical theologians use of the garden. He was in probation. Yeah. That if he would have uh, 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 oh, would have taken care of the disobedience he would have lived in the garden the rest of the time eaten and that sin would not have entered the world and on and on and on, and on. Mm -hmm. well that was not God's plan so therefore he allowed this is the most baffling thing how a spiritually alive person who is righteous mm -hmm. would go against God mm -hmm. but guess what I am spiritually alive and I have spiritual eyes to see now, but I still <clears throat> sin. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so therefore, even though it's strange, uh, he had all the advantages that we do not have as people today of unbelievers. He had a, he, he had a, a, a nature toward God. He had a, a, a propensity for righteousness. And he chose differently. And why? The Bible doesn't say. I mean, I, I mean, I, I understand all that. But when we say, okay, Adam has that that free will, what he did, he ate up the fig and fruit. And at the same time, now we're getting over here when we're talking about capitalism and, and Armenianism regarding the free will. Are they not the same? That's that's they seem to contradict. Yeah. What what seems to contradict? Well, that, that Adam has free will, but we don't. But God's will was done in both instances? Yes. Yeah. Seems illogical yes. because you're saying in one instance it can happen and one that it can't, but you're okay with that. Well, if, if Adam had a sinful nature, he would be in bondage to his sinful nature. He wasn't in bondage to his sinful nature. Okay. Because he didn't have one. I don't have a sinful nature today, in my opinion. But I have what is Paul calls the flesh. Yeah. Some people call it a sinful nature and then another. But you start doing that, you don't find that in, literally in Scripture. So I would rather use biblical terms. Mm -hmm. I, have a, I am a new man now with a flesh Paul calls the propensities and habits and things that try to lead me away from, from God. Mm -hmm. And so therefore I'm not totally depraved now as a believer. I still have to fight sin, but I'm not like I'm not totally dead right. in my previous condition. Now I've been made alive. He just didn't take all of it away yet okay. that it once will be. Correct. Okay. So therefore I I am in a constant battle and I would lose every time if I didn't have the Holy Spirit. The more the Spirit of God controls me, the less I will sin. So, I, I guess... Notice, even in our sanctification, in Philippians 2, 12 and 13, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. He's worked it in. Work it out. No, we're sanctified. Get work. Right. And then it says... Uh, for God, ha for see, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For uh, well, God, that's a senior moment. Um, So I got. Uh, let me quote it, and I'll get you, bro. Okay. For it is God who's at work in you, both to will and to work of His good pleasure. What's that? Go ahead. Philippians two, thirteen, twelve, and thirteen. Letter part. So I got what you're saying that God is the one who initiates, uh, who give us the faith to believe, 
and who give us the will because now once we accept him, we have that new in this nature, which we can't help but to accept. Yeah, because you're alive. As you're, because you're alive. Correct? Correct. Correct. Uh, I guess, I guess in that, you just got to be careful not to say that, you know, where we get into this free will fight. That's, that's all I'm trying to make sure that. Well, the way I have, you notice what I say. Uh -huh. well, you don't believe in free will, Prop. Oh, well, it all depends on how you define it. Remember, I started that a right. long time ago. I've learned over the years that stops people in their tracks. Mm -hmm. If you say, well, man doesn't have free will, you, 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 you're in a fight. They're not even going to listen to you. But if you say, well, you know, it all depends on how you define it. And they go, gosh, I never thought about that. I don't even know how I define it. Right. So then I define it. And they have to then deal with it. I said, man is free to act according to his nature. Well, what's his nature? So it's now not a will problem, but an anthropological question of, of what I believe is total depravity. So it's a hamartiology anthropology question now. Is man sinful? How sinful is he? And so those would come. Yeah. But Adam had to sin. Correct. He, at the point in time. Yeah, yes, that's, that's correct. Point in time, he had yeah, right. he had not seen. It was no option. It was no option. Right, right. There was no option. Right. Yeah, and the only reason there's no option because he never was tested. And that's why he was in probation. But wait a minute. If he's free to act according to his nature, and his nature is righteousness, yes, how could he sin? That's how I was going about to get. I don't know. I, scripture said, doesn't said. tell me. I don't know how that happened. Because like when we're in heaven, and evidently he was free to sin. Even though he had a nature toward it. I mean, I have a nature toward God now because of what God has done. It's different from Adam's. What is different from Adam? Because we took on Adam's nature. Yeah, and yeah. We, but we, I've now been redeemed. I, I have, I'm not totally depraved uh, as I would define the unbeliever. Mm -hmm. But I have sin I still have to deal with. Mm -hmm. But he didn't have the sin nature. Initially. That's correct. Right. And then when we're so heaven, he's different than right, what we were. Right. So, but, or we are, excuse me. But we're, when we're in heaven, we... will not be able to sin. We won't be able to sin, but we have, we'll have free will. We will be the freest. I don't say we have... How, we you have to define that. Yeah. So I always say you're going to be the freest you'll ever be. Yeah. And yet we won't sin. Because I, I will act according to, to the, the glorified nature, nature glorified that nature, I have. Yeah, the right, glorified right, nature. Right. Okay. Glorified nature. I mean, that's why I stop people at first. I'll say... Are you going to be able to have to sin in heaven? You, you're, you're telling me your definition uh, of free will is I, I have the ability to choose evil and good, but when you get to heaven, you're not going to, are you going to be able to sin? Oh, 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 no, no, no. I said, well, then you won't be free, according to your definition. <clears throat> and yet you'll be the freest you'll ever be. Isn't there only two wills, really? The will's God and the will's enemy? Uh, that's in a different realm. Uh, instead of in the human realm, uh, the human realm we have those who are uh, connected, who, whose wills are connected to their nature, which is sinful, and we as believers who have a new nature, and, but we still fight with sin. So that's a different kind of of, of, of situation in how they will. And then there's those who will be glorified who will never sin again. Because they don't have a sinful nature because they're glorified or will be glorified completely when they receive their glorified bodies. How's that? You know the one sin I always have to come back to that we all struggle with is that yeah, sin of Adam's, that like disobedience. What I want to see. Because it's well, always that, that, that one that you really have to check over and over again is the obedience. Whether it's God or authority or whatever, obedience is, is one that I know that I still struggle with. That it, it's just... Yeah. I, I want to be free. Yeah. Yeah. Romans 7. Yeah, Romans 7. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, these are the questions you've got to ask. I do not, I, I'm taking time because, you know, I've gone on these questions over and over. I mean, I have my answers. You don't have to take my answers, but you are asking the right questions. Okay. Hope nobody's bored. Absolutely. Yeah. Real quick. So, mm -hmm. the Arminian view, um, they do believe in regeneration, but after they believe. Is that correct? 
some you know, may... Because we believe regeneration, then you believe. Yeah. They, must, they must believe some, the other way around, right? Or, yes. The, uh, an Arminian would say that you believe and are regenerated. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay. And I think that is false. Right, I know. But, but I'm uh, just trying to figure out their timeline. Uh -huh. It must be that sequence of events if they want to stay consistent. Yeah, and a lot of times if they didn't know better and don't know me, they would try to argue with me that I'm making a theological point and not an exegetical point, and that's where 1 John 5, 1 comes to play. Okay, maybe we'll go over that too. Okay, Doc, uh, are, you, are you moving from uh, B? Because... Uh, B? I don't know if I even got into A yet. Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, because I have a question. That's all right. Go ahead. <laughs> Good. Uh, Good. 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 Now, it's good to notice that first of all, in 1 John chapter 2, 1 and 2, I, I'm dealing with the debate whether Christ died for everybody or for just the elect. I, I believe the latter. And I am a minority in this school on that issue. <laughs> and uh, I have coveted that I will not make it an issue in the sense of, of causing division at the school. And I've been here 25 years and not planning on doing it. Professor, but I will tell you my view and you could just say, oh, I don't believe it or I do believe it. Were you always uh, a limited atonement? No. Or did you, when did you switch? In my soteriology class at Dallas Theological Seminary. Gotcha. Not because the teacher was a Calvinist. It's because I saw there was less problems switching okay. personally, both theologically and exegetically. Who was the prof in the soteriology class? I was wondering if it was... No, nah, you don't know him. Okay. I was just wondering if it was S. Lewis Johnson or not. No, nah, it wasn't S. Lewis. I'd love to have S. Lewis. Oh, yeah. He was a Calvinist. Full well, because he changed Calvinist. his view as well. Yes, 65. That's why I asked. 1965. Yeah. Unless my understanding... So that's limited atonement. Is, is the, limited atonement would be that he died for the elect. Only. For the elect. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. His, now, it's important. And when I had, I preach this stuff so I know the questions that come up. It's important to say that Christ's death was able to save billions and billions and infinitely billions of worlds if he wanted to. But what was the purpose? In other words, the, I'm not limiting the value of how many souls it could be saved. It's limitless. But what was the purpose for which he died? Okay. So I'm not, I'm not limiting that Christ's atonement could only save the elect. It could have saved infinite amount of people. It, it, the question is, what purpose did God say it was to, uh, to be when he died? It's interesting yeah. to find all of these answers when we get to the other yeah. side of glory. Yeah. Yeah. You know what, Doc? Yeah. And now what you're saying, because I think this is what, that, that's all I was trying to get to. This is the verse that uh, Carlton Pearson used when he's trying to deal with universalism. Mm -hmm. When he said that Christ, uh, you are already saved because Christ already died for the whole world. Well, I can give you a worse one. Uh, uh, one that would be more and that's found in um, Romans 8 verse let's see oh excuse me Romans 5 sorry <laughs> that's an 8 where did I say that Romans 5 18 so then as through one transgression there resulted not potentially resulted I mean Romans 5 18 resulted in condemnation to all men did that happen to all men all sin except Christ right even so through one act of righteousness there resulted justification of life to all men the universalists use that text well, they must love saying it. that all men is everybody in the world. How are you going to handle that? I usually let my students 
stew on it when I'm in my Romans class. The answer is how this is typical. How is the author arguing? The author is arguing by representative people. All the whom Adam represented are the all Christ, people and all Christ whom Christ represented. Represented. Yeah. But remember, all to whom he represented and whom he died for resulted in justification. Mm-hmm. 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 Okay? Yeah. The next one is in Romans 8, 24, uh, 32, excuse me. Romans 8, 32. Now, I, I have to start with verse 31, okay? What then shall we say to these things? What th- I, I have placed you in the middle of the context of Romans 8, 31, and I'm now talking about these things, and you should be saying, oh, what, are the, what are the three of these things? It is at least verses 29 and 30. Which says, whom he foreknew, he also predestined. Whom he predestined, he called. And whom he called, he also justified. Whom he justified, he glorified. Those are the elect. Right? Now it says this. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. You go, hey, us all. Okay, hold on, hold on. How will he not also with him freely give us all? All things. Who are the, what is the all things? Well, it goes back to the all things of verse 31, which we said goes back to 29 through 30. So all for whom he Christ died, he will therefore glorify. I went through Romans and I said to myself, self, if this is true that I have come to, I should find it in Romans. I have found it in two places. Then notice it's not potential. All for whom he dies, he's going to give all things. All things what? Contextually, is at least 29 and 30. What does he call the next verse? Who can go against God's what? Interesting. Playing right into my hand. I'm just exegeting the text. Now, you don't have to agree with me. Let's go back to 28 too, because he said, who, you know, for all things, uh, for those who I do go back who to, are called. So that call would also be the elect as well, right? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. 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 Notice verse 30, he predestined these he also called. Did any of those predestined not call? No, he got the same ones. And then whom he called, these all he justified. Did anybody call not being justified? No. So you just go out. These are the all things that he's talking about. And so when you come to verse 32, he, the, the all for who Christ died, he doesn't potentially give them all things. He says, I give them all things. So I argue from the context then, it must be his elect, which he talks about in the next verse. So my, the con- context is very strong, in my opinion. Now, I have to handle 1 John 2.2. Because 2, they're going to say, well, what about 1 John 2.2? 2, 2? A few other verses. Mm-hmm. So that's why I'm now dealing with 1 John 2.2. 2. Gotcha. i got 10 minutes. 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> we, we can get back to it. But to win some converts. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, notice that... The theological advocacy of the work of Christ in verse 1 of chapter 2 of 1 John is only for believers and not for unbelievers. Several places in the scripture it says, I don't pray pray for not, I don't pray for unbelievers. I pray for the elect or those who are going to come. I, I didn't say it, Jesus said it. Okay? So the contextion the contextual uh, part of it is the word chi or and at the beginning of 1 John 2 2. He's saying whatever verse 1 is saying, it's also applying to verse 2. 
In other words, he makes the advocacy of Christ in verse 1 and the propitiation in verse 2 coextensive to the same people. The same people who he makes advocacy for there is the same people for whom he dies. And, but he doesn't pray for the whole world. Now, you might be able to get around that, but you still have to, that is a problem for a general atonement that he has to deal with, which most people don't even think about, I found. The grammatical verb is the propitiation is in, I've been accused, and Calvinists have been accused of, of, of making statements because of their theological position. And I'm finding it's just the opposite. The word is in this context is not, it is in the indicative mood in Greek, which means it's a statement of fact from the author's viewpoint. And not from the potential mood of subjective or optative mood. In other words, the grammar is against the thought that Christ potentially the propitiation for the sin of the whole world. Because ultimately I can get them to say, well, he didn't propitiate everybody. Because why? Somebody's going to hell. So he must say he must you must ultimately say it's potentially he died he died for all the from a, uh, uh, the world because he didn't make a propitiation for the entire world if he actually did their sins are forgiven are you with me mm-hmm. and it says he is the propitiation not he might be he says he is so I'm saying to the general Thomas, you're now making assumptions from the from the text that I don't have to make. Is in the indicative mood mean he actually did it, and I'm saying that he did did it for the elect. You're saying he has to potentially do it, and that's not in the mood here in this text. So you got a problem. You might be able to get around that, but you got to handle it. I don't. Are you with me? So what am I doing? I'm just taking grammatical points or what the text is actually saying on that. A theological argument. Some claim the texts which speak of Christ dying for his people are easier to, to reconcile with the so-called world passages if the atonement is unlimited. Not so. It is plainly far easier to assign plausible reasons why if Christ died particularly for his elect that the New Testament authors use terms like world. Why? Because the elect were scattered among all the world. The nations and generations and undistinguishable by us from the mass of unfallen humanity to whom the gospel is indiscriminately offered. However, if... He died to make the salvation of the world without distinction only possible, then there is no clear and compelling reason that the New Testament could connect the death of Christ was for the purpose of certainly saving his elect. Yeah. So it's for not the collective world, but the elected that are scattered throughout the world. That's what I was kind of getting to. Exactly. What and you're going to find that there's a. I got word studies that have maybe 17 definitions of John's use of word of the of the word cosmos in the New Testament. Now I think you could probably summarize them and squeeze them into ten or eight. But if you want to get all the the different little nuances, I've seen up to 17 different definitions. Professor Lok- uh, excuse me, Professor Sullivan, <laughs> can you back up one, one no, slide? No, Professor Loken does not believe this. <laughs> I, know, I know, I know what he believes. Can you back up one slide on the is? Uh-huh. Okay, so on that is, you said it's potential mm. propitiation? Mm. Not? It's in the indicative mood, which is the statement of fact from the author's viewpoint. It so, actually happened. So right, so he says he's the propitiation for our sins, and he's talking about believers, right? Yes. Our sins, and not for ours only, but then he would say, but... 
But that's what I, I guess I'm getting kind of confused on. Not only for our sins, but then why would he always say, but also for those of the whole world? He's making a contrast. Yeah, between those, yeah, bro. But isn't he talking about those who are present that he's specifically talking to, as opposed to those that are scattered or not right. amongst us? Yeah, because you've got John so he, saying, I am writing to, to you, audience. ours is the first hours. Like, he himself is the propitiation for our sins, me and you, because we're talking, mm -hmm. right? And not for ours only, but for those of the whole world, all the believers everywhere, yeah. scattered, scattered yeah. everywhere. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> you, guys, you guys are picking this up. You're rare. <laughs> You're rare. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't so there, I got I, I got my students answering my questions. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I mean, you don't you don't. Let me say this to you: you don't need to even believe me, but you need to be able to, to, to understand it to be able to say, "Well, this is what they will say, whether you believe it or not." Because we have a global concept. Yeah. And we want to we want to include everybody. Yeah. Instead of speaking to a singular group uh, of people that are amongst everybody. Yeah. Now, the word propitiation is only applied to believers in any other text that the word is found. Now, I agree it's only found in one, two, three other passages, so it's limited. The, the use of the word world or whole world Unbelieving accused people in 1 John 5, 9, the whole world, the accused world, lies in the power of the evil one. Would you say believers do that? I don't think so. So can John use a limited word for the whole world? Guess what? Yeah. We're, we're not sophisticated enough. Yet if John 17, 15, our Lord says... Believers are not under the evil one. First John 5, 4 through 5 says the believers overcome the world by his faith. So when people say whole world, it's got to be every single person in the whole world, not in every context. Even in First John. I just showed you the passage in chapter 5, verse 19. Both the earth and all people without exception in Revelation 3.10 tribulation time will come on the whole world on every person and the created earth. It's interesting. I'm believing in, and possibly some believers in Revelation 12.9 Satan in the tribulation will deceive the whole world but not believers in the tribulation. Okay. Colossians 1 6, the gospel is going into all the world, the world in a geographic sense, but not in every single person in the world. You pick that one up. Romans 1 8, the Roman church faith is proclaimed throughout the whole world. You telling me that the little church in Rome, every person in the entire world at that time knew that church? No. Oh, the faith that spread geographically. To all the known world, but not every person in the whole world heard it. Luke chapter 2, verse 1 the census from Caesar went out to all the inhabited earth, to all the Roman Empire. <laughs> First John 2 2, then, the whole world, to both ethnically, both Jews and Gentiles, and geographically but not to every person who ever lived. John uses a phrase in his letter to the book uh, uh, in Revelation uh, that uh, helped me uh, and notice that 1 John is also writing the Revelation, right? Yes. Um, uh, let's see. Five seven and worthy art five nine for worthy are you to take the book and break its seals for you were slain and did purchase for God you, uh, by your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation so oftentimes the word world or all people means 
people in every tribe or tongue or people and nation, but not every person in the entire world. Yeah. But is there any any evidence that that the, the original audience that they would have been able to discern all of this this way? And like in, in I mean even in secular literature, I mean is there because it, well, I haven't checked the secular literature. I have checked the scriptures. And my question then would be to you, I'll, ask, I'll answer your question by asking the question. In 1 John five nineteen, it says, We know that we are of God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. How would they take that? It can't be the whole world of believers because he just made a distinction that it isn't. So he's already limited the whole world to something more than, than not the believers because the believers aren't in his hands. So how do you take word world, all, or whole world, this, that, and the other? You have to determine what is the author saying according to the context. You may disagree with me in one context, this, that, and the other, but I think the wisest thing to say is those phrases are, I mean, I, I, I could say tonight, well, after classes, I'll go to uh, DQ and I'll buy you an ice cream cone. When I say let us all, I don't mean everybody in the world. I mean in this context of this room. So it's that kind of thing that you have to do with every time you use that word. No matter what. I take it both ethnically and geographically in this context. Because that's what he's making. First of all, you've already brought out, he's already making that Jew-Gentile Jew, Jew, connection there, a believer and unbeliever kind of thing. But also I think it's geographically uh, throughout the world too. Uh, what is this? Oh, then which I can't do now, and I'll stop here, but I'll tease you. I will now give you a biblical theology of the concept of the word world in John's gospel. Next class, though, right? Yeah, if you, if you want me to do it. I'd like to hear it. Can we go and get that for tonight? <laughs> <laughs> you almost stayed at 11 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I don't want to stay at 11 <laughs> But uh, this, this is... I was challenged with, well, how could you do this? And so what I did was take John's uh, gospel and began to take how he uses the concept of the word world. And it, it, it has personally um, confirmed what I've already told you. And we will do that next time if you want me to. All right. I, it is not my goal to make you a five-point Calvinist, okay? But please make sure. Okay, but <laughs> but please make sure you know what it is, so that you can uh, be able to say it correctly. So that if you don't believe it, you still are you're characterizing it correctly. I hope I'm doing that with the other side. Four pointers and five pointers are both saved. So yes, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> Lord, thank you for these dear men uh, that are, are are zealous for your scriptures. I sense it and I thank you for it. And thank you for their life. And again, I want to pray for David and for his um, situation, for his work, and for Chris, and for his difficult situation he has in ministry, that you might be pleased to use it greatly and we be able to rejoice with them uh, even if you'd give uh, David a job this week, we will give you the great praise and adoration. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I have your papers. Oh.